Hello. Welcome to Roman on CVI. I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, adaptations in the environment that are intended to help orient students with CVI. Um, I am an O&M specialist and um, I have watched a lot of O&M people struggle with this. I've also seen some pretty incredible um, talent in this area as well. So I'd like to just take a few moments and review um, environmental adaptations. So hmm, who, who gets their environment ad adapted? Well, it can be anyone. It can be even a person in phase one CBI. Obviously, the color and the distance and the presence of movement might all need to be factors. In general, <clears throat> We have to ask ourselves, where does this person need to go? Where do they need to move? Do they need to move within um, a, a familiar environment or are they going to start moving out? One of the keys I think it's really important to think about is how independently is this person able to navigate, even if they don't walk on their own? Um, even if a person is being pushed in a wheelchair, they have a right and a need to know where they're going and to anticipate what's next, and find their way back. So, environmental adaptations follow a few principles. Obviously, color is critical. The use of a vibrant, usually fluorescent color can be very helpful. I do recommend that when you're placing a color cue somewhere in the environment, that you do it based on the salient feature of that environmental um, location. So the edge of a door, or highlighting where, a, where an exit sign is, or a corner where a person needs to turn to get to a particular destination. Some people have things they hang on a door, because, um, and that could change day by day depending upon where that student is moving. But to highlight too many things is to make nothing salient. To use too many colors is to add confusion. Um, we want to pair that color adaptation, that cue, with a naturally occurring landmark and something that is meaningful and necessary for that individual's travel. I sometimes suggest that we just add, ask somebody of the same age, how do, you, how do you know where you're going? If you're going from here to the cafeteria, what are you looking for? How do you know when to turn? Sometimes that very simple approach can be very enlightening. Um, <clears throat> also want to, sometimes we can use an iPad to also help the child see what's coming next and what highlight material we're looking for. So this is the corner. We put a bright orange stripe on this so you'll remember to turn there. Let's see if we can find it in the hallway now. So the iPad can be used to help preview that and even to discuss it um, as, as it's happening or after. It's important um, not to use a whole variety of types of adaptations because again it can be confusing to the student and can add more complexity. Eventually we want those highlighted cues removed and the landmark itself like the water fountain, the corner, the exit sign remains. So be very judicious about where you put those, those materials because in the end you're hoping that that individual seeks out that information ultimately without that adaptation. It's also important that as a student's learning a new environment that you use comparative language to talk about how this setting is like your school that you went to last year, but this time the cafeteria is um, you know, next to the office. And last year it was next to the gymnasium. Something that would help talk about what's the same but what's different. And the use of maps can be very, very helpful in this way. So all the places that you would highlight can be represented in two dimension or three dimension using a, an object map or um, an iPad map or a, a map that is a two dimensional map if the student is in high phase two and up. But it's really important to give that individual a chance not just to move through space, but to begin to think about the larger space and where they are in that space. It actually helps um, reduce egocentricity because the individual 
uh, has to think about more than just where they are at the moment. It helps them think about what's ahead of them, what's behind them. It helps reinforce temporal relations because um, you can begin to ask questions about what, how would, would you get to the cafeteria faster or would you get to the front door faster? So you begin to learn about time and space. Um, it is a, it's a really, really helpful task. It's also a great way, as I said, to review where a person has been. So maps are not just necessary for getting someone somewhere, but for bringing these concepts of space to a higher level, to um, a place where the child begins to represent information really cognitively. They can be as complex or as simple as you think the individual can handle, but obviously must be matched to that person's CVI range score. Um, so, and I feel as though maps are often disregarded or thought to be unnecessary, especially for an individual who is not moving themselves through space independently. But in fact, it may even be more important for those individuals because they are not able to just get up and explore on their own. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that um, finally that um, sometimes people avoid either O&M instruction or the use of maps for students with CVI because they will report to me that, well, it's not necessary, you know. She can always just get there. If I say, you know, go to the door, she always finds the door. But the point isn't that the child can perform this task. It's really how they do it. You want the individual to be more than living in the moment. You want them to think about the system they use to do it so that hopefully that system can be transferred to new settings and new places where the skills can be generalized. So to me, getting there isn't as important as knowing how the person did it. An example that I see a lot at um, Pediatric View is when I ask students to do a, a treasure hunt or look for objects, some are familiar, some are novel, out in about a 40-foot hallway, when I'm all done with that task, I will ask the individual, to show me the way back to my office. You know, you can lead, I'll follow you. And almost always, regardless of age, the student with CVI cannot do it. They can, and it requires two turns maximum. So that tells me that this individual has followed people moving out, the, out of the doorway, but they haven't gathered information about their environment in doing so. If I had used, you know, um, some adaptations, if I had talked about it, if I had previewed it, if I asked the individual to, to tell me or show me what we're looking for next, I think the situation would be different about those individuals finding their way back. In a way, it's kind of like, you know, you as providers are that individual's GPS. They never have to think about how they're getting somewhere. You're just going to take them by the shoulders and turn them or prompt them or you know, encourage them to come forward if they make a wrong turn. Just like your GPS tells you all the time where to go. But like your GPS, if you had to repeat that route, um, you might be in trouble because if you haven't gathered, you know, systematically and intentionally information that really confirms where you are and helps you use that information in the future, you're really just act. It, it's really just an act of one time. It has no real learning involved. I hope this has been helpful, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.